chapter five of crusaders of new france by william bennett monroe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the iron governor the ten years following sixteen hundred and sixty three form a decade of extraordinary progress in the history of new france the population of the colony had trebled and now numbered approximately seven thousand the red peril thanks to tracy's energetic work had been lessened while the fur trade had grown to large and lucrative proportions with this increase in population and prosperity there came a renaissance of enthusiasm for voyages of exploration and for the widening of the colony's frontiers glowing reports went home to the king concerning the latent possibilities of the new world what the colony now needed was a strong and vigorous governor who would not only keep a firm hold upon what had been already achieved but one who would also push on to greater and more glorious things it was in keeping with this spirit of faith and hope that the king sent to quebec in sixteen hundred and seventy two louis de buade count frontignac naming him governor of all the french domains in north america fifty-two years of age when he came to canada frontenac had been a soldier from his youth he had fought through hard campaigns in italy in the low countries and with the venetians in their defence of candia against the turks in fact he had but shortly returned from this last service when he was chosen to succeed courcelle as the royal representative in new france to frontenac's friends the appointment seemed more like a banishment than a promotion but there were several reasons why the governor should have accepted gladly he had inherited only a modest fortune and most of this had been spent for thrift was not one of frontenac's virtues his domestic life had not been happy and there were no strong personal ties binding him to life in france moreover the post of governor in the colony was not to be judged by what it had been in the days of de vaujour or de mazy the report sent home by talon had stirred the national ambitions i am no courtier this intendant had written and it is not to please the king or without reason that i say this portion of the french monarchy is going to become something great what i now see enables me to make such a prediction and indeed the figures of growth in population of acreage cleared and of industries rising into existence seem to justify the intendant's optimism both the king and his ministers were building high hopes on canada as their choice of frontenac proves and in their selection of a man to carry out their plans they showed on the whole good judgment frontenac proved to be the ablest and most commanding of all the officials who served the bourbon monarchy in the new world in the long line of governors he approached most nearly to what a viceroy ought to be it is true that in new france there were conditions which no amount of experience in the old world could train a man to handle nor was frontenac particularly fitted by training or temperament for all of the duties which his new post involved in some things he was well endowed he had great physical endurance a strong will with no end of courage and industry to spare these were qualities of the highest value in a land encircled by enemies and forced to depend for existence upon the strength of its own people but more serviceable still was his ability 
in adapting himself to a new environment men past fifty do not often show this quality in marked degree but frontenac fitted himself to the novelty of colonial life exceedingly well in his relations with the indians he showed amazing skill no other colonial governor english french or dutch ever commanded so readily the respect and admiration of the red man but in his dealings with the intendant and the bishop with the clergy and with all those among the french of new france who showed any disposition to disagree with him frontenac displayed an uncontrollable temper an arrogance of spirit and a degree of personal vanity which would not have made for cordial relations in any field of human effort he had formed his own opinions and was quite ready to ride rough shod over those of other men it was this impetuosity that served to make the official circles of the colony during many months of his term a little hell of discord but when the new viceroy arrived at quebec he was in high fettle he was pleased with the situation of the town and flattered by the enthusiastic greeting which he received from its people his first step was to familiarize himself with the existing machinery of colonial government which he found to be far from his liking he proceeded accordingly in his own imperious way to make some startling changes for one thing he decided to summon a representative assembly made up of the clergy the seigneurs and the common folk of new france this body he brought together for his inauguration in october sixteen hundred and seventy two no such assembly had ever been convened before and nothing like it was ever allowed to assemble again before another year had passed the minister sent frontenac a polite reprimand with the intimation that the king could not permit in the colony an institution he was doing his best and with entire success to crush out at home the same fate awaited the governor's other project the establishment of a municipal government in the town of quebec within a few months of his arrival frontenac had allowed the people of the town to elect a syndic and two aldermen but the minister vetoed this action with the admonition that you should very rarely or to speak more correctly never give a corporate voice to the inhabitants for it is well that each should speak for himself and no one for all in the reorganization of colonial administration therefore the governor found himself promptly called to a halt he therefore turned to another field where he was much more successful in having his own way from the day of his arrival at quebec the governor saw the pressing need of extending french influence and control into the regions bordering upon the great lakes to dissipate the colony's efforts in westward expansion however was exactly what he had been instructed not to do the king and his ministers were sure that it would be far wiser to devote all available energies and funds to developing the settled portions of the land they desired the governor to carry on the policy of encouraging agriculture which talon had begun thus solidifying the colony and making its borders less difficult to defend frontenac's instructions on this point could hardly have been more explicit his majesty considers it more consistent with the good of his services wrote colbert that you apply yourself to clearing and settling the most fertile places that are nearest the sea-coast and the communication with france than to think afar of explorations in the interior of the country so distant that they can never be inhabited by frenchmen this was discouraging counsel showing neither breadth of vision nor familiarity with the urgent needs of the colony frontenac courageously set these instructions aside and in doing so he was wise 
had he held to the letter of his instructions new france would never have been more than a strip of territory fringing the lower st lawrence more than any other frenchman he helped to plan the great empire of the west notwithstanding the narrow views of his superiors at versailles frontenac was convinced that the colony could best secure its own defence by controlling the chief line of water communications between the iroquois country and montreal to this end he prepared to build a fort at cataraki where the st lawrence debouches from lake ontario he was not however the first to recognize the strategic value of this point talon had marked it as a place of importance some years before and the english authorities at albany had been urged by the iroquois chiefs to forestall any attempt that the french might make by being first on the ground but the english procrastinated and in the summer of sixteen hundred and seventy three the governor with an imposing array of troops and militia made his way to cataraki having first summoned the iroquois to meet him there in solemn council in rather high dudgeon they came ready to make trouble if the chance arose but frontenac's display of armed strength his free-handed bestowal of presents his tactful handling of the chiefs and his effective oratory at the conclave soon assured him the upper hand the fort was built and the iroquois while they continued to regard it as an invasion of their territories were forced to accept the new situation with reluctant grace this stroke at cataraki inflamed the governor's interest in western affairs during his conferences with the indians he had heard much about the great waters to the west and the rich beaver lands which lay beyond he was ready therefore to encourage in every way the plans of those who wished to undertake journeys of exploration and trade into these regions even although he was well aware that such enterprises would win little commendation from his superiors at the royal court vorageur ready to undertake these tasks there were in plenty and all of them found in the iron governor a stalwart friend foremost among these pioneers of the far country was robert cavalier de la salle whom frontenac had placed for a time in command of the fort at cataraki and who in sixteen hundred and seventy eight was commissioned by the governor to forge another link in the chain by the erection of a fort at niagara there he also built a small vessel the first to ply the waters of the upper lakes and in this la salle and his lieutenants made their way to michilimackinac how he later journeyed to the mississippi and down that stream to its mouth is a story to be told later on in these pages it was and will remain a classic in the annals of exploration and without frontenac's vigorous support it could never have been accomplished la salle when he performed his great feat of daring and endurance was still a young man under forty but his courage firmness and determination were not surpassed by any of his race he had qualities that justified the confidence which the governor reposed in him but while la salle was the most conspicuous among the pathfinders of this era he was not the only one tonti du lut la forêt la motte cadillac and others were all in frontenac's favour and all had his vigorous support in their work intrepid woodsmen they covered every portion of the western wilderness building forts and posts of trade winning the friendship of the indians planting the arms of france in new soil and carrying the vexilla regis into parts unknown before if frontenac could have had his way if the king had provided him with the funds he would have run an iron chain of fortified posts all along the great water routes from cataraki to the mississippi 
and he had lieutenants who were able to carry out such an undertaking but there were great obstacles in the way the lukewarmness of the home government the bitter opposition of the jesuits and the intrigues of his colleagues yet the governor was able to make a brave start and before he had finished he had firmly laid the foundations of french trading supremacy in these western regions during the first three years after his coming to canada the governor had ruled alone there was no intendant or bishop to hamper him for both talon and laval had gone to france in sixteen hundred and seventy two but in sixteen hundred and seventy five laval returned to the colony and in the same year a new intendant jacques du chenot was appointed with this change in the situation at quebec the friction began in earnest for frontenac's imperious temper did not make him a cheerful sharer of authority with any one else if the intendant and the bishop had been men of conflicting ideas and dispositions frontenac might easily have held the balance of power but they were men of kindred aims and they readily combined against the governor united in their opposition to him they were together a fair match for frontenac in ability and astuteness it was not long accordingly before the whole colony was once more aligned in two factions with the governor were the merchants many of the seigneurs and all the coureurs de bois supporting the intendant and the bishop were many of the subordinate officials all of the priests and those of the tradesmen and habitants with whom the clerical influence was paramount the story of the quarrels which went on between these two factions during the years sixteen hundred and seventy five to sixteen hundred and eighty is neither brief nor edifying the root of it all lay in the governor's western policy his encouragement of the forest traders or coureurs de bois and his connivance at the use of brandy in the indian trade there were unseemly squabbles about precedence at council meetings and at religious festivals about trivialities of every sort but the question of the brandy trade was at the bottom of them all the bishop flayed the governor for letting this trade go on the missionaries declared that it was proving the ruin of their efforts and the intendant declared that frontenac allowed it to continue because he was making a personal profit from the traffic charges and countercharges went home to france with every ship the intendant wrote dispatches of wearisome length rehearsing the governor's usurpations insults and incompetence disorder he told the minister rules everywhere universal confusion prevails justice is openly perverted and violence supported by authority determines everything in language quite as unrestrained frontenac recounted in detail the difficulties with which he had to contend owing to the intendant's obstinacy intrigue and dishonesty the minister appalled by the bewildering contradictions could only lay the whole matter before the king who determined to try first a courteous reprimand and to that end sent an autograph letter to each official both letters were alike in admonishing the governor and the intendant to work in harmony for the good of the colony but each concluded with the significant warning unless you harmonize better in the future than in the past my only alternative will be to recall you both this intimation coming straight from their royal master was to each a rebuke which could not be misunderstood but it did not accomplish much for the bitterness and jealousy existing between the two colonial officers was too strong to be overcome the very next vessels took to france a new budget of complaints and recriminations from both the king as good as his word issued prompt orders for their recall and the two officials left for home but not on the same vessel in the summer of sixteen hundred and eighty two the question as to which of the two was the more at fault is hardly worth determining the share of blame to be cast on each by the verdict of history should probably be about equal frontenac was by far the abler man but he had the defects of his qualities he could not brook the opposition of men less competent than he was and when he was provoked his arrogance became intolerable 
in broader domains of political action he would soon have outgeneraled his adversary but in these petty fields of neighbourhood bickering duchesneau particularly with the occasional nudgings which he received from laval proved no unequal match the fact remains that neither was able or willing to sacrifice personal animosities nor to display any spirit of cordial cooperation even at the royal command the departure of both was regarded as a blessing by the majority of the colonists to whom the continued squabbles had become wearisome yet there was not lacking in the minds of many among them the conviction that if ever again new france should find itself in urgent straits if ever there were critical need of an iron hand to rule within and to guard without there would still be one man whom so long as he lived they could confidently ask to be sent out to them again for the time being however frontenac's official career seemed to be at an end at sixty-two he could hardly hope to regain the royal favour by further service he must have left the shores of new france with a heavy heart frontenac's successor was le bar an old naval officer who had proved himself as capable at sea as he was now to show himself incompetent on land he was the antithesis of his headstrong predecessor weak in decision without personal energy without imagination but likewise without any of frontenac's skill in the art of making enemies with la barre came mule an abler and more energetic colleague who was to succeed du chanot as intendant both reached quebec in the autumn of sixteen hundred and eighty two and problems in plenty they found awaiting them shortly before their arrival a fire had swept through the settlement at quebec leaving scarcely a building on the lands below the cliff to make matters worse the iroquois had again thrown themselves across the western trade route and had interrupted the coming of the colony's fur supply as every one now recognized that the protection of this route was essential la barre decided that the iroquois must be taught a lesson preparations in rather ostentatious fashion were therefore made for a punitive expedition and in the summer of sixteen hundred and eighty four the governor with his troops was at kataraki at this point however he began to question whether a parley might not be a better means of securing peace than the laying waste of indian lands accordingly it was arranged that a council with the iroquois should be held across the lake from kataraki at a place which later took the name of la famine from the fact that during the council the french supplies ran low and the troops had to be put on short rations after negotiations which the cynical chronicler la Hontan has described with picturesque realism an inglorious truce was patched up the new governor was sadly deficient in his knowledge of the indian temperament he had given the iroquois an impression that the french were too proud to fight for their part the iroquois offered him war or peace as he might choose and la barre assured them that he chose to live at peace when the expedition returned to quebec there was great disgust throughout the colony the echoes of which were not without their effect at versailles and la barre was forthwith recalled in his place the king sent out the marquis de denonville in sixteen hundred and eighty five with power to make war on the tribesmen or to respect the peace as he might find expedient upon his arrival the new governor was an honest well-intentioned soul neither mentally incapable nor lacking in personal courage he might have served his king most acceptably in many posts of routine officialdom but he was not the man to handle the destinies of half a continent in critical years his mission to be sure was no sinecure for the iroquois had grown bolder with the assurance of support from the english now that they were securing arms and ammunition from albany it was probable that they would carry their raids right to the heart of new france de nonville was therefore forced to the conclusion that he had better strike quickly in making this decision he was right for in dealing with savage races a thrust is almost always the best defence armed preparations were consequently once more placed under way and in the summer of sixteen hundred and eighty seven a flotilla of canoes and bateaux bearing soldiers and supplies was again at kataraki this time the expedition was stronger in numbers and better equipped than ever before down the lakes from michilimackinac came a force of coureurs de bois among them seasoned veterans of the wilderness like du lutte tonti la forêt morale de la 
and nicolas perrot each worth a whole squad of soldiers when it came to fighting the iroquois in their own forests at the rendezvous across the lake from cataraqui the french and their allies mustered nearly three thousand men denonville had none of his predecessor's bravado coupled with cowardice his plans were carried forward with a precision worthy of frontenac unlike frontenac however he had a scant appreciation of the skill with which the red man could get out of the way in the face of danger by moving too slowly after he had set out overland towards the seneca villages he gave the enemy time to place themselves out of his reach so he burned their villages and destroyed large areas of growing corn after more than a week had been spent in laying waste the land denonville and his expedition retired slowly to cataraqui leaving part of his force there the governor went westward to niagara where he rebuilt in more substantial fashion la salle's old fort at that point and placed it in charge of a garrison the coureurs de bois then continued on their way to michilimackinac while denonville returned to montreal the expedition of sixteen hundred and eighty seven had not been a fiasco like that of sixteen hundred and eighty five but neither was it in any real way a success it angered the whole iroquois confederacy without having sufficiently impressed the indians with the punitive power of the french denonville had stirred up the nest without destroying the hornets it was all too soon the indians turned to show what they could do as ravagers of unprotected villages within a year after the french expedition had returned the iroquois bands were raiding the territory of the french to the very outskirts of montreal itself the route to the west was barred the fort at niagara had to be abandoned cataraqui was cut off from succor and ultimately had to be destroyed by its garrison not a single canoe load of furs came down from the lakes during the entire summer the merchants were facing ruin and the whole colony was beginning to tremble for its very existence the seven years since frontenac left the land had indeed been a lurid interval it was at this juncture that tidings of the colony's dire distress were hurried to the king and the grand monarch moved with rare good sense he promptly sent for that grim old veteran whom he had recalled in anger seven years before in all the realm frontenac was the one man who could be depended upon to restore the prestige of france along the great trade routes the great onontio as frontenac was known to the indians reached the st lawrence in the late autumn of sixteen hundred and eighty nine just as the colony was about to pass through its darkest hours quebec greeted him as a redemptor patriae its people in the words of la hontan were as jews welcoming the messiah nor was their enthusiasm without good cause for in a few years frontenac demonstrated his ability to put the colony on its feet once more he settled its internal broils opened the channels of trade restored the forts repulsed the english and brought the iroquois to terms now that his mission had been achieved and he was no longer as robust as of old the iron governor asked the minister to keep him in mind for some suitable sinecure in france if the opportunity came this the minister readily promised but the promise was still unfulfilled when frontenac was stricken with his last illness on november twenty eighth sixteen hundred and ninety eight the greatest of the onontiers or governors passed away devoted to the service of his king says his eulogist more busied with duty than with gain inviolable in his fidelity to his friends he was as vigorous a supporter as he was an untiring foe had his official career closed with his recall in sixteen hundred and eighty two frontenac would have ranked as one of the singular misfits of the old french colonial system but the brilliant successes of his second term made men forget the earlier days of petulance and petty bickerings in the sharp contrasts of his nature frontenac was an unusual man combining many good and great qualities with personal shortcomings that were equally pronounced in the civil history of new france he challenges attention as the most remarkable figure End of chapter 5chapter six of crusaders of new france by william bennett munro this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six la salle 
and the voyageur the greatest and most enduring achievement of frontenac's first term was the exploration of the territory southwestward of the great lakes and the planting of french influence there this work was due in large part to the courage and energy of the intrepid la salle rene robert cavalier sieur de la salle like so many others who followed the fleur de lis into the recesses of the new continent was of norman birth and lineage rouen was the town of his nativity the year sixteen hundred and forty three probably the date of his birth how the days of his youth were spent we do not know except that he received a good education presumably in a jesuit seminary while still in the early twenties he came to montreal where he had an older brother a priest of the seminary of saint sulpice this was in sixteen hundred and sixty six through the influence of his brother no doubt he received from the seminary a grant of the seigneury at la chine on the river above the town and at once began the work of developing this property if la salle intended to become a yeoman of new france his choice of a site was not of the best the seigneury which he acquired was one of the most dangerous spots in the whole colony being right in the path of iroquois attack he was able to gather a few settlers around him it is true but their homes had to be enclosed by palisades and they hardly dared venture into the fields unarmed though the iroquois and the french were just now at peace the danger of treachery was never absent on the other hand no situation could be more favourable for one desiring to try his hand at the fur trade it was inevitable therefore that a young man of la salle's adventurous temperament and commercial ancestry should soon forsake the irksome drudgery of clearing land for the more exciting and apparently more profitable pursuit of forest trade that was what happened in the winter of sixteen hundred and sixty eight to sixteen hundred and sixty nine he heard from the indians their story of a great southwestern river which made its way to the vermilion sea the recital quickened the restless strain in his norman blood here he thought was the long-sought passage to the shores of the orient and he determined to follow the river having no other means of obtaining funds with which to equip an expedition la salle sold his seigneury and at once began his preparations in july sixteen hundred and sixty nine he set off with a party of about twenty men some of whom were missionaries sent by the seminary of st sulpice to carry the tidings of the faith into the heart of the continent up the st lawrence and along the south shore of lake ontario they went halting at arondequat bay while la salle and a few of his followers went overland to the seneca villages in search of guides continuing to niagara the party divided and the sulpicians made their way to the salt st marie while la salle with the remainder of the expedition struck out south of lake erie and in all probability reached the ohio by descending one of its branches but as no journal or contemporary record of the venture after they had left niagara has come down to us the details of the journey are unknown it is believed that desertions among his followers prevented further progress and that in the winter of sixteen hundred and sixty nine to sixteen hundred and seventy la salle retraced his steps to the lakes in its main object the expedition had been a failure having exhausted his funds la salle had no opportunity for the present at least of making another trial he accordingly asked frontenac for trading privileges at cataraqui the site of modern kingston where stood the fortified post named after the governor upon frontenac's recommendation la salle received in sixteen hundred and seventy four not only the exclusive right to trade but also a grant of land at fort frontenac on condition that he would rebuild the defences with stone and supply a garrison 
the conditions being acceptable the explorer hastened to his new post and was soon engaged in the fur trade upon a considerable scale la salle however needed more capital than he himself could supply and in sixteen hundred and seventy seven he made a second trip to france with letters from frontenac to the king and colbert he also had the further design in view of obtaining authority and funds for another trip of exploration to the west since his previous expedition in sixteen hundred and sixty nine two of his compatriots pere marquette and louis joliet had reached the great river and had found every reason for believing that its course ran south to the gulf of mexico and not southwestward to the gulf of california as had previously been supposed but they had not followed the mississippi to its outlet and this was what la salle was now determined to do in paris he found attentive listeners to his plans and even the king's ministers were interested so that when la salle sailed back to quebec in sixteen hundred and seventy eight he brought a royal decree authorizing him to proceed with his project with him came a daring spirit who was to be chief lieutenant and faithful companion in the ensuing years henri de tonty this adventurous soldier was later known among the indians as tonty of the iron hand for in his youth he had lost a hand in battle and in its stead now wore an artificial one of iron which he used from time to time with wholesome effect he was a man of great physical strength and commensurate courage loyal to his chief and almost la salle's equal in perseverance la salle's party lost no time in proceeding to fort frontenac even though the winter was at hand hennepin was at once sent forward to niagara with instructions to build a post and to begin the construction of a vessel so that the journey westward might be begun with the opening of spring later in the winter la salle and tonty joined the party at niagara where the fort was completed before spring arrived a vessel of about forty-five tons the largest yet built for service on the lakes had been constructed on its prow stood a carved griffin from the armorial bearings of frontenac and out of its portholes frowned several small cannon with the advent of summer la salle and his followers went aboard the sails were spread and in due course the expedition reached michimackinac where the jesuits had already established their most westerly mission the arrival of the griffin brought indians by the hundred to marvel at the floating fort and to barter their furs for the trinkets with which la salle had provided himself the little vessel then sailed westward into lake michigan and finally dropped anchor in green bay where an additional load of beaver skins was put on deck with the approach of autumn the return trip began la salle however did not accompany his valuable cargo having a mind to spend the winter in explorations along the illinois in september with many misgivings he watched the griffin set sail in charge of a pilot then with the rest of his followers he started southward along the wisconsin shore reaching the mouth of the st joseph he struck into the interior to the upper kankakee this stream the voyageurs who numbered about forty in all descended until they reached the illinois which they followed to the point where peoria now stands here la salle's troubles began in abundance the indians endeavored to dissuade him from leading the expedition farther and even the explorer's own followers began to desert chagrined at these untoward circumstances and on his guard lest the indians prove openly hostile la salle proceeded to secure his position by the erection of a fort to which he gave the name creve here he left tonty with the majority of the party while he himself started with five men back to niagara his object was in part to get supplies for building a vessel at fort crevecoeur and in part to learn what had become of the griffin for since that vessel had sailed homeward he had heard no word from her crew proceeding across what is now southern michigan la salle emerged on the shores of the detroit river 
from this point he pushed across the neck of land to lake erie where he built a canoe which brought him to niagara at easter tide sixteen hundred and eighty his fears for the fate of the griffin were now confirmed the vessel had been lost and with her a fortune in furs nothing daunted however la salle hurried on to fort frontenac and thence with such speed to montreal that he accomplished the trip from the illinois to the ottawa in less than three months a feat hitherto unsurpassed in the annals of american exploration at montreal the explorer who once more sought the favor of frontenac was provided with equipment at the king's expense within a few months he was again at fort frontenac and ready to rejoin tonty at crevecoeur just as he was about to depart however word came that the crevecoeur garrison had mutinied and had destroyed the post la salle's one hope now was that his faithful lieutenant had held on doggedly and had saved the vessel he had been building but tonty in the meantime had made his way with a few followers to green bay so that when la salle reached the illinois he found every one gone undismayed by this climax to his misfortunes la salle nevertheless pushed on down the illinois and early in december reached its confluence with the mississippi to follow the course of this great stream with the small party which accompanied him seemed however too hazardous an undertaking la salle therefore retraced his steps once more and spent the next winter at fort miami on the st joseph to the southeast of lake michigan in the spring word came to him that tonty was at michilimackinac and thither he hastened to hear from tonty's own lips the long tale of disaster any one else wrote an eye-witness of the meeting would have thrown up his hands and abandoned the enterprise but far from this with a firmness and constancy that never had its equal i saw him more resolved than ever to continue his work and push forward his discovery now that he had caught his first glimpse of the mississippi la salle was determined to persist until he had followed its course to the outlet returning with tonty to fort frontenac he replenished his supplies in this same autumn of sixteen hundred and eighty one with a larger number of followers the explorer was again on his way to the illinois by february the party had reached the mississippi passing the missouri and the ohio la salle and his followers kept steadily on their way and early in april reached the spot where the father of waters debouches through three channels into the gulf here at the outlet they set up a column with the insignia of france and as they took possession of the land in the name of their king they chanted in solemn tones the exaudiat and in the name of god they set up their banners but the french were short of supplies and could not stay long after the symbols of sovereignty had been raised aloft paddling slowly against the current la salle and his party reached the illinois only in august here la salle and tonty built their fort st louis and here they spent the winter during the next summer sixteen hundred and eighty three the indefatigable explorer journeyed down to quebec and on the last ship of the year took passage for france in the meantime frontenac always his firm friend and supporter had been recalled and la barre the new governor was unfriendly a direct appeal to the home authorities for backing seemed the only way of securing funds for further explorations accordingly early in sixteen hundred and eighty four la salle appeared at the french court with elaborate plans for founding a colony in the valley of the lower mississippi this time the expedition was to proceed by sea to this project the king gave his assent and commanded the royal officers to furnish the supplies by midsummer four ships were ready to set sail for the gulf once more however troubles beset la salle on every hand disease broke out on the vessels the officers quarrelled among themselves the expedition was attacked by the spaniards and one ship was lost not until the end of december was a landing made and then not at the mississippi's mouth but at a spot far to the west of it on the sands of matagorda bay 
finding that he had missed his reckonings la salle directed a part of his company to follow the shore after many days of fruitless search they established a permanent camp and sent the largest vessel back to france their repeated efforts to reach the mississippi overland were in vain finally in the winter of sixteen hundred and eighty seven la salle with a score of his strongest followers struck out northward determined to make their way to the lakes where they might find succour to follow the detail of their dreary march would be tedious the hardships of the journey without adequate equipment or provisions and the incessant danger of attack by the indians increased petty jealousies into open mutiny on the nineteenth of march sixteen hundred and eighty seven the courageous and indefatigable la salle was treacherously assassinated by one of his own party here in the fastnesses of the southwest died at the age of forty-four the intrepid explorer of new france whom tonty called perhaps not untruthfully one of the greatest men of this age thus writes a later historian with all the perspective of the intervening years was cut short the career of a man whose personality is impressed in some respects more strongly than that of any other upon the history of new france his schemes were too far-reaching to succeed they required the strength and resources of a half-dozen nations like the france of louis the fourteenth nevertheless the lines upon which new france continued to develop were substantially those which la salle had in mind and the fabric of a wilderness empire of which he laid the foundations grew with the general growth of colonization and in the next century became truly formidable it was not until wolfe climbed the heights of abraham that the great ideal of la salle was finally overthrown it would be difficult indeed to find among the whole array of explorers which history can offer in all ages a perseverance more dogged in the face of abounding difficulties phoenix like he rose time after time from the ashes of adversity neither fatigue nor famine disappointment nor even disaster availed to swerve him from his purpose to him more than to any one else of his time the french could justly attribute their early hold upon the great regions of the west other explorers and voyageurs of his generation there were in plenty and their service was not inconsiderable but in courage and persistence as well as in the scope of his achievements la salle the pathfinder of rouen towered above them all he had what so many of the others lacked a clear vision of what the great plains and valleys of the middle west could yield towards the enrichment of a nation in years to come america as parkman has aptly said owes him an enduring memory for in this masculine figure she sees the pioneer who guided her to the possession of her richest heritage End of chapter six chapter seven of crusaders of new france by william bennett monroe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the church in new france nearly all that was distinctive in the life of old canada links itself in one way or another with the catholic religion from first to last in the history of new france the most pervading trait was the loyalty of its people to the church of their fathers intendants might come and go governors abode their destined hour and went their way but the apostles of the ancient faith never for one moment released their grip upon the hearts and minds of the canadians during two centuries the political life of the colony ran its varied rounds the habits of the people were transformed with the coming of material prosperity but the church went on unchanged unchanging one may praise the steadfastness with which the church fought for what its bishops believed to be right 
or one may on the other hand decry the arrogance of its pretensions to civil power and its hampering conservatism but as the great central fact in the history of new france the hegemony of catholicism cannot be ignored when frenchmen began the work of founding a dominion in the new world their own land was convulsed with religious troubles not only were the huguenots breaking from the trammels of the old religion but within the catholic church itself in france there were two great contending factions one group strove for the preservation of the gallican liberties the special rights of the french king and the french bishops in the ecclesiastical government of the land while the other claimed for a pope a supremacy over all earthly rulers in matters of spiritual concern it was not a difference on points of doctrine for the gallicans did not question the headship of the papacy in things of the spirit what they insisted upon was the circumscribed nature of the papal power in temporal matters within the realm of france particularly with regard to the right of appointment to ecclesiastical positions with endowed revenues bishops priests and religious orders ranged themselves on one side or the other for it was a conflict in which there could be no neutrality as the royal authorities were heart and soul with the gallicans it was natural enough that priests of this group should gain the first religious foothold in the colony the earliest priests brought to the colony were members of the recollet order they came with champlain in sixteen hundred and fifteen and made their headquarters in quebec at the suggestion of the king's secretary for ten years they labored in the colony striving bravely to clear the way for a great missionary crusade but the day of the recollet in new france was not long in sixteen hundred and twenty five came the advance guard of another religious order the militant jesuits bringing with them their traditions of unwavering loyalty to the ultramontane cause the work of the recollet had on the whole been disappointing for their numbers and their resources proved too small for effective progress during ten years of devoted labor they had scarcely been able to make any impression upon the great wilderness of heathenism that lay on all sides in view of the apparent futility of their efforts the coming of the jesuits suggested it may be by champlain was probably not unwelcome to them richelieu moreover had now brought his ultramontane sympathies close to the seat of royal power so that the king no longer was in a position to oppose the project at any rate the jesuits sailed for canada and their arrival forms a notable landmark in the history of the colony their dogged zeal and iron persistence carried them to points which missionaries of no other religious order would have reached for the jesuits were above all things else the harbingers of a militant faith their organization and their methods admirably fitted them to be the pioneers of the cross in new lands they were men of action seeking to win their crown of glory and their reward through intense physical and spiritual exertions not through long seasons of prayer and meditation in cloistered seclusion loyola the founder of the order gave to the world the nucleus of a crusading host disciplined as no army ever was if the jesuits could not achieve the spiritual conquest of the new world it was certain that no others could and this conquest they did achieve the whole course of catholic missionary effort throughout the western hemisphere was shaped by the members of the jesuit order only four of these priests came to quebec in sixteen hundred and twenty five although it was intended that others should follow at once 
their number was not substantially increased until seven years later when the troubles with england were brought to an end and the colony was once more securely in the hands of the french then the jesuits came steadily a few arriving with almost every ship and either singly or together they were sent off to the indian settlements to the hurons around the georgian bay to the algonquins north of the ottawa and to the iroquois south of the lakes the physical vigor the moral heroism and the unquenchable religious zeal of these missionaries were qualities exemplified in a measure and to a degree which are beyond the power of any pen to describe historians of all creeds have tendered homage to their self-sacrifice and zeal and never has work of human hand or spirit been more worthy of tribute the jesuit went often alone where no others dared to go and he faced unknown dangers which had all the possibilities of torture and martyrdom nor did this energy waste itself in flashes of isolated triumph the jesuit was a member of an efficient organization skilfully guided by inspired leaders and carrying its extensive work of christianization with machine-like thoroughness through the vastness of five continents we are too apt to think only of the individual missionary's glowing spirit and rugged faith his picturesque strivings against great odds and to regard him as a guerrilla warrior against the hosts of darkness had he been this and nothing more his efforts must have been altogether in vain the great services which the jesuit missionary rendered in the new world both to his country and to his creed were due not less to the matchless organization of the order to which he belonged than to qualities of courage patience and fortitude which he himself showed as a missionary during the first few years of jesuit effort among the indians of new france the results were pitifully small the hurons among whom the missionaries put forth their initial labors were poor stock even as red men went the minds of these half nomadic and dull-witted savages were filled with gross superstitions and their senses had been brutalized by the incessant torments of their iroquois enemies amid the toils and hazards and discomforts of so insecure and wandering a life the jesuits found little opportunity for soundly instructing the hurons in the faith hence there were but few neophytes in these early years by sixteen hundred and forty the missionaries could count only a hundred converts in a population of many thousands and even this little quota included many infants who had died soon after receiving the rites of baptism more missionaries kept coming however the work steadily broadened and the posts of service were multiplied in due time the footprints of the jesuits were everywhere from the st lawrence to the mississippi from the tributaries of the hudson to the regions north of the ottawa lejeune massé brebeuf l'allemand ragueneau le dablon jean garnier rainbow perron moyne alloway brillette chaumonneau maynard bressani daniel chabanel and a hundred others they soon formed that legion whose works of courage and devotion stand forth so prominently in the early annals of new france once at their stations in the upper country the missionaries regularly sent down to the superior of the order at quebec their full reports of progress difficulties and hopes all mingled with interesting descriptions of indian customs folklore and life it is no wonder that these narratives jotted down hastily as le jeune tells us now in one place now in another sometimes on water sometimes on land were often crude or that they required careful editing before being sent home to france for publication in their printed form however these relations des jesuites gained a wide circle of european readers they inspired more missionaries to come and they drew from well-to-do laymen large donations of money 
for carrying on the crusade the royal authorities also gave their earnest support for they saw in the jesuit missionary not merely a torch-bearer of his faith or a servant of the church they appreciated his loyalty and remembered that he never forgot his king nor shirked his duty to the cause of france among the tribes every mission post thus became an embassy and every jesuit an ambassador of his race striving to strengthen the bonds of friendship between the people to whom he went and the people from whom he came the french authorities at quebec were not slow to recognize what an ever-present help the jesuit could be in times of indian trouble one governor expressed the situation with fidelity when he wrote to the home authorities that although the interests of the gospel do not require us to keep missionaries in all the indian villages the interests of the civil government for the advantage of trade must induce us to manage things so that we may always have at least one of them there it must therefore be admitted that when the civil authorities did encourage the missions they did not always do so with a purely spiritual motive in mind as the political and commercial agent of his people the jesuit had great opportunities and in this capacity he usually gave a full measure of service after he had gained the confidence of the tribes the missionary always succeeded in getting the first england of what was going on in the way of intertribal intrigues he learned to fathom the indian mind and to perceive the redskins motives he was thus able to communicate to quebec the information and advice which so often helped the french to outwit their english rivals as interpreters in the conduct of negotiations and the making of treaties the jesuits were also invaluable how much indeed these black robes achieve for the purely secular interests of the french colony for its safety from sudden indian attack for the development of its trade and for its general upbuilding will never be known the missionary did not put these things on paper but he rendered services which in all probability were far greater than posterity will ever realize it was not however with the conversion of the indians or with the service of french secular interests among the savages that the work of the jesuits was wholly or even chiefly concerned during the middle years of the seventeenth century these services at the outposts of french territory may have been most significant for the french population along the shores of the st lawrence remained small the settlements were closely huddled together and a few priests could serve their spiritual needs the popular impression of jesuit enterprises in the new world is connected almost wholly with work among the indians this pioneer phase of the jesuits work was picturesque and historians have had a great deal to say about it it was likewise of this service in the depths of the interior that the missionary himself wrote most frequently but as the colony grew and broadened its bounds until its settlements stretched all the way from the saguenay to montreal and beyond a far larger number of curés was needed before the old regime came to a close there were far more frenchmen than indians within the french sphere of influence in america and they required by far the greater share of jesuit ministration and long before the old dominion ended the indian missions had to take a subordinate place in the general program of jesuit undertakings the outposts in the indian country were the chief scene of jesuit labors from sixteen hundred and fifteen to about seventeen hundred when the emphasis shifted to the st lawrence valley some of the mission fields held their own to the end but in general they failed to make much headway during the last half century of french rule the church in the settled portions of the colony however kept on with its steady progress in achievement and power new france was the child of missionary fervor even from the outset in the scattered settlements along the st lawrence the interests of religion were placed on a strictly missionary basis 
there were so-called parishes in the colony almost from its beginning but not until seventeen hundred and twenty two was the entire colony set off into recognized ecclesiastical parishes each with a fixed cure in charge through all the preceding years each village or coat had been served by a missionary by a movable cure or by a priest sent out from the seminary at quebec no priest was tied to any parish but was absolutely at the immediate beck and call of the bishop some reason for this unsettled arrangement might be found in the conditions under which the colony developed in its early years with its sparse population ranging far and wide with its lack of churches and of presbytere in which the priest might reside but the real explanation of its long continuance lies in the fact that if regular cure were appointed the seigneur would lay claim to various rights of nomination or patronage whereas the bishop could control absolutely the selection of missionary priests and could thus more easily carry through his policy of ecclesiastical centralization not only in this particular but in every other phase of religious life and organization during these crusading days in canada one must reckon not only with the logic of the situation but also with the dominating personality of the first and greatest ultramontane bishop laval though not himself a jesuit for no member of the order could be a bishop laval was in tune with their ideals and saw eye to eye with the jesuits on every point of religious and civil policy francois xavier de laval abbe de montigny was born in sixteen hundred and twenty two a scion of the great house of montmorency he was therefore of high nobility the best born of all the many thousands who came to new france throughout its history as a youth he had come into close association with the jesuits and had spent four years in the famous hermitage at cannes that jesuit stronghold which served so long as the nursery for the spiritual pioneers of early canada when he came to quebec as vicar apostolic in sixteen hundred and fifty nine he was only thirty-seven years of age his position in the colony at the time of his arrival was somewhat unusual for although he was to be in command of the colony's spiritual forces new france was not yet organized as a diocese and could not be so organized until the pope and the king should agree upon the exact status of the church in the french colonial dominions laval was nevertheless given his titular rank from the ancient see of patria in arabia which had long since been in partibus infidelium and hence had no bishop within its bounds from his first arrival in canada he was bishop laval but without a diocese over which he could actually hold sway his commission as vicar apostolic gave him power enough however and his responsibility was to the pope alone for the tasks which he was sent to perform laval had eminent qualifications a haughty spirit went with the ultra blue blood in his veins he had a temperament that loved to lead and to govern and that could not endure to yield or to lag behind his intellectual talents were high beyond question and to them he added the blessing of a rugged physical frame no one ever came to a new land with more definite ideas of what he wanted to do or with a more unswerving determination to do it in his own way it was not long before the stamp of laval's firm hand was laid upon the life of the colony in due course too he found himself at odds with the governor the dissension smouldered at first and then broke out into a blaze that warmed the passions of all elements in the colony the exact origin of the feud is somewhat obscure and it is not necessary to put down here the details of its development to the war a outrance which soon engaged the civil and ecclesiastical authorities in the colony in the background was the question of the Carreau de bois and the liquor traffic which now became a definite issue and which remained the storm centre of colonial politics for many generations the merchants insisted that if this traffic were extinguished it would involve the ruin of the french hold upon the indian trade 
the bishop and the priests on the other hand were ready to fight the liquor traffic to the end and to exorcise it as the greatest blight upon the new world quebec soon became a cockpit where the battle of these two factions raged each had its ups and downs until in the end the traffic remained but under a makeshift system of regulation to portray laval and his associates as always in bitter conflict with the civil power nevertheless would be to paint a false picture church and state were not normally at variance in their views and aims they clashed fiercely on many occasions it is true but after their duels they shook hands and went to work with a will at the task of making the colony stand upon its own feet historians have magnified these bickerings out of all proportion squabbles over matters of precedence at ceremonies over the rate of the tithes and over the curbing of the coureurs de bois did not take the major share of the church's attention for the greater part of two whole centuries it loyally aided the civil power in all things wherein the two could work together for good and these ways of assistance were many for example the church through its various institutions and orders rendered a great service to colonial agriculture as the greatest landowner in new france it set before the seigneurs and the habitants an example of what intelligent methods of farming and hard labor could accomplish in making the land yield its increase the king was lavish in his grants of territory to the church the jesuits received nearly a million arpents as their share of the royal bounty the bishop and the quebec seminary the sulpicians and the ursulines about as much more of the entire granted acreage of new france the church controlled about one quarter so that its position as a great landowner was even stronger in the colony than at home nor did it fold its talents in a napkin colonists were brought from france farms were prepared for them in the church seigneuries and the new settlers were guided and encouraged through the troublous years of pioneering with both money and brains at its command the church was able to keep its own lands in the front line of agricultural progress when in seventeen hundred and twenty two the whole colony was marked off into definite ecclesiastical divisions seventy-two parishes were established and nearly one hundred curés were assigned to them as time went on both parishes and curés increased in number so that every locality had its spiritual leader who was also a philosopher and guide in all secular matters the priest thus became a part of the community and never lost touch with his people the habitant of new france for his part never neglected his church on weekdays the priest and the church were with him at work and at play the spirit and the life of every community though paid a meagre stipend the cure worked hard and always proved a labourer far more than worthy of his hire the clergy of new france never became a caste a privileged order they did not live on the fruits of other men's labour but gave to the colony far more than the colony ever gave to them as for the church revenues these came from several sources the royal treasury contributed large sums but as it was not full to overflowing the king preferred to give his benefactions in generous grants of land yet the royal subsidies amounted to many thousand livres each year the diocese of quebec was endowed with the revenues of three french abbeys wealthy laymen in france followed the royal example and sent contributions from time to time frequently of large amount while the company of one hundred associates controlled the trade of the colony it made from its treasury some provisions for the support of the missionaries after sixteen hundred and sixty three a substantial source of ecclesiastical income was the tithe an ecclesiastical tax levied annually upon all produce of the land and fixed in sixteen hundred and sixty three at one thirteenth four years later it was reduced to one twenty sixth and bishop laval's strenuous efforts to have the old rate restored were never successful in education yet another field of colonial life the church rendered some service here the civil authorities did nothing at all and had it not been for the church the whole colony would have grown up in absolute illiteracy a school for boys was established at quebec in champlain's day and during the next hundred and fifty years it was followed by about thirty others more than a dozen elementary schools for girls were also established under ecclesiastical auspices 
yet the amount of secular education imparted by all these seminaries was astoundingly small and they did but little to leaven the general illiteracy of the population only the children of the towns attended the schools and the program of study was of the most elementary character religious instruction was given the first place and received so much attention that there was little time in school hours for anything else the girls fared better than the boys on the whole for the nuns taught them to sew and to knit as well as to read and to write so far as secular education was concerned therefore the english conquest found the colony in almost utter stagnation not one in five hundred among the habitants it was said could read or write outside the immediate circle of clergy officials and notaries ignorance of even the rudiments of education was almost universal there were no newspapers in the colony and very few books save those used in the services of worship gray salon du lut the king of the voyageurs for example was a man of means and education but his entire library as disclosed by his will consisted of a world atlas and a set of josephus the priests did not encourage the reading of secular books and la hontan recounts the troubles which he had in keeping one militant cure from tearing his precious volumes to pieces new france was at that period not a land where freedom dwelt with knowledge intellectually the people of new france comprised on the one hand a small elite and on the other a great unlettered mass there was no middle class between yet the population of the colony always contained especially among its officials and clergy a sprinkling of educated and scholarly men these have given us a literature of travel and description which is extensive and of high quality no other american colony of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries put so much of its annals into print the relations of the jesuits alone were sufficient to fill forty-one volumes and they form but a small part of the entire literary output End of chapter seven chapter eight of crusaders of new france by william bennett munro this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight seigneurs of old canada from the beginning of the colony there ran in the minds of french officialdom the idea that the social order should rest upon a seigneurial basis historians have commonly attributed to richelieu the genesis of new world feudalism but without good reason for its beginnings antedated the time of the great minister the charter issued to the ill-starred la roche in fifteen hundred ninety eight empowered him to grant lands to gentlemen in the forms of fiefs and seigneuries and the different viceroys who had titular charge of the colony before the company of one hundred associates took charge in sixteen hundred and twenty seven had similar powers several seigneurial grants in the region of quebec had in fact been made before richelieu first turned his attention to the colony nor was the adoption of this policy at all unnatural despite its increasing obsolescence the seigneurial system was still strong in france and dominated the greater part of the kingdom the nobility and even the throne rested upon it the church as suzerain of enormous landed estates sanctioned and supported it the masses of the french people were familiar with no other system of landholding no prolonged quest need accordingly be made to explain why france transplanted feudalism to the shores of the great canadian waterway in fact an explanation would have been demanded had any other policy been considered no one asks why the puritans took to massachusetts bay the english system of freehold tenure they took the common law of england and the tenure that went with it along with the fleur-de-lis likewise went the custom of paris and the whole network of social relations based upon a hierarchy of seigneurs and dependents the seigneurial system of land tenure as all students of history know was feudalism in a somewhat modernized form during the chaos which came upon western europe in the centuries following the collapse 
of roman imperial supremacy every local magnate found himself forced to depend for existence upon the strength of his own castle under whose walls he gathered as many vassals as he could induce to come to these he gave the surrounding lands free from all rents but on condition of aid in time of war the lord gave the land and promised to protect his vassals who on their part took the land and promised to pay for it not in money or in kind but in loyalty and service thus there was created a close personal relation a bond of mutual wardship and fidelity which bound liegeman and lord with hoops of steel the whole social order rested upon this bond and upon the gradations in privilege which it involved in a sequence which became stereotyped in its day feudalism was a great institution and one which shared with the christian church the glory of having made mediaeval life at all worth living it helped to keep civilization from perishing utterly in a whirl of anarchy and it enabled europe to recover inch by inch its former state of order stability and law but having done its service to humanity feudalism did not quietly make way for some other system more suited to the new conditions it hung on grimly long after the forces which had brought it into being ceased to exist long after the growth of a strong monarchy in france with a powerful standing army had removed the necessity of mutual guardianship and service to meet the new conditions the system merely changed its incidents never its general form the ancient obligation of military service no longer needed gave place to dues and payments the old personal bond relaxed the feudal lord became the seigneur a mere landlord the vassal became the censitaire a mere tenant paying heavy dues each year in return for protection which he no longer received nor required in a word before sixteen hundred the feudal system had become the seigneurial system and it was the latter which was established in the french colony of canada in the new land there was reason to hope however that this system of social relations based upon land holding would soon work its way back to the vigour which it had displayed in mediaeval days here in the midst of an unfathomed wilderness was a small european settlement with hostile tribes on every hand the royal arm so strong in affording protection at home could not strike hard and promptly in behalf of subjects a thousand leagues away new france accordingly must organize itself for defence and repel her enemies just as the earldoms and duchies of the crusading centuries had done and that is just what the colony did with the seigneurial system as the groundwork of defensive strength under stress of the new environment which was not wholly unlike that of the former feudal days the military aspects of the system revived and the personal bond regained much of its ancient vigour the sordid phases of seigneurialism dropped into the background it was this restored vitality that helped more than all else to turn new france into a huge armed camp which hordes of invaders both white and red strove vainly to pierce time after time during more than a full century the first grant of a seigneury in the territory of new france was made in sixteen hundred and twenty three to louis hebert a paris apothecary who had come to quebec with champlain some years before this date his land consisted of a tract upon the height above the settlement and here he had cleared the fields and built a home for himself by this indenture feudalism cast its first anchor in new france and hebert became the colony's first patron of husbandry other grants soon followed particularly during the years when the company of one hundred associates was in control of the land for by the terms of its charter this organization was empowered to grant large tracts as seigneuries and also to issue patents of nobility 
it was doubtless assumed by the king that such grants would be made only to persons who would actually emigrate to new france and who would thus help in the upbuilding of the colony but the company did not live up to this policy instead it made lavish donations some of them containing a hundred square miles or more to directors and friends of the company in france who neither came to the colony themselves nor sent representatives to undertake the clearing of these large estates one director took the entire island of orleans others secured generous slices of the best lands on both shores of the st lawrence but not one of them lifted a finger in the way of redeeming these huge concessions from a state of wilderness primeval the tracts were merely held in the hope that some day they would become valuable out of sixty seigneuries which were granted by the company during the years from sixteen hundred and thirty two to sixteen hundred and sixty three not more than a half dozen grants were made to bona fide colonists at the latter date the total area of cleared land was scarcely four thousand arpents with the royal action of sixteen hundred and sixty three which took the colony from the company and reconstructed its government the seigneurial system was galvanized at once with new energy the uncleared tracts which the officials of the company had carved out among themselves were declared to be forfeited to the crown an actual occupancy was held to be for the future the essential of every seigneurial grant a vigorous effort was made to obtain settlers and with considerable success for in the years sixteen hundred and sixty five to sixteen hundred and sixty seven the population of the colony more than doubled nothing was left undone by the royal authorities in securing and transporting emigrants officials from paris scoured the provinces offering free passage to quebec and free grants of land upon arrival the campaign was successful and many shiploads of excellent colonists most of them hardy peasants from normandy brittany parish and picardy were sent during these banner years on their arrival at quebec the incoming settlers were taken in hand by officials and were turned over to the various seigneurs who were ready to provide them with lands and to help them in getting well started if the newcomer happened to be a man of some account at home and particularly if he brought some money with him he had the opportunity to become a seigneur himself he merely applied to the intendant who was quite willing to endow with the seigneury any one who appeared likely to get it cleared and ready for future settlers in this matter the officials following out the spirit of the royal orders were prone to err on the side of liberality too often they gave large seigneurial grants to men who had neither the energy nor the funds to do what was expected of a seigneur in the new land as for extent the seigneuries varied greatly some were as large as a european dukedom others contained only a few thousand arpents there was no fixed rule within reasonable limits each applicant obtained what he asked for but it was generally understood that men who had been members of the french noblesse before coming to the colony were entitled to larger areas than those who were not in any case little attention was paid to exact boundaries and no surveys were made in making his request for a seigneury each applicant set forth what he wanted and this he frequently did in such broad terms as all lands between such and such a river and the seigneury of the sieur de so and so these descriptions rarely adequate or accurate were copied into the patent causing often hopeless confusion of boundaries and unneighbourly squabbles it was fortunate that most seigneurs had more land than they could use otherwise there would have been as many lawsuits as seigneuries the obligations imposed upon the seigneurs were not burdensome no initial payment was asked and there were no annual rentals to be paid to the crown each seigneur had to render the ceremony of fealty and homage to the royal representative at quebec each was liable for military service although that obligation was not written into the grant 
when a seigneury changed owners otherwise than by inheritance in direct succession a payment known as the quint being as the name connotes one-fifth of the reported value became payable to the royal treasury but this was rarely collected the most important obligation imposed upon the canadian seigneur and one which did not exist at all in france was that of getting settlers established upon his lands this obligation the authorities insisted upon above all others the canadian seigneur was expected to live on his domain to gather dependents around him to build a mill for grinding their grain to have them level the forest clear the fields and make two blades of grass grow where one grew before in other words the canadian seigneur was to be a royal immigration and land agent combined he was not given his generous landed patrimony in order that he should sit idly by and wait for the unearned increment to come many of the seigneurs fulfilled this trust to the letter robert gifford who received the seigneury of beauport just below quebec was one of these charles le moyne sieur de longueville was another both brought many settlers from france and saw them safely through the years of pioneering others however did no more than flock to quebec when ships were expected like so many real estate agents explaining to the new arrivals what they had to offer in the way of lands fertile and well situated still others did not even do so much but merely put forth one excuse after another to explain why their tracts remained without settlements at all from time to time the authorities prodded these seigneurial drones and threatened them with the forfeiture of their estates but some of the laggards had friends among the members of the sovereign council or possessed other means of warding off action so that final decrees of forfeiture were rarely issued occasionally there were seigneurs whose estates were so favourably situated that they could exact a bonus from intending settlers but the king very soon put a stop to this practice by the arrêt of marly in seventeen hundred and eleven he decreed that no bonus or prix d'entrée should be exacted by any seigneur but that every settler was to have land for the asking and at the rate of the annual dues customary in the neighbourhood at this date there were some ninety seigneuries in the colony about which we have considerable information owing to a careful survey which was made in seventeen hundred and twelve at the king's request this work was entrusted to an engineer Gadeon de catalogne who had come to quebec a quarter of a century earlier to help with the fortifications catalogne spent two years in his survey during which time he visited practically all the colonial estates as a result he prepared and sent to france a full report giving in each case the location and extent of the seigneury the name of its owner the nature of the soil and its suitability for various uses the products the population the condition of the people the provisions made for religious instruction and various other matters with the report he sent three maps one of which has disappeared the others show the location of all seigneuries in the regions of quebec and three rivers from catalogne's survey we know that before seventeen hundred and twelve nearly all the territory on both shores of the st lawrence from below quebec to above montreal had been parcelled into seigneuries likewise the islands in the river and the land on both sides of the richelieu in the region toward lake champlain had been allotted many of the seigneuries in this latter belt had been given to officers of the carignan salier regiment which had come out with tracy in sixteen hundred and sixty five to chastise the mohawks after the work of the regiment had been finished talon suggested to the king that it be disbanded in canada that the officers be persuaded to accept seigneuries and that the soldiers be given lands within the estates of their officers the grand monarch not only assented but promised a liberal money bonus to all who would remain accordingly more than twenty officers chiefly captains or lieutenants and nearly four hundred men agreed to stay in new france under these arrangements 
here was an experiment in the system of imperial rome repeated in the new world when the empire of the caesars was beginning to give way before the oncoming goths and huns the practice of disbanding the legions on the frontier so that they might settle there and form an iron ring against the invaders was adopted and served its purpose for a time it was from these praedia militaria that talon got the idea which he now transmitted to the french king with the suggestion that the practice of these sagacious and warlike romans might be advantageously followed in a land which being so far away from its sovereign must trust for existence to the strength of its own arms in keeping with the same precedent talon located the military seigneuries in that section of the colony where they would be most useful as a barrier against the enemy that is to say he placed them in the colony's most vulnerable region this was the area along the richelieu from lake champlain to its confluence with the st lawrence at sorel it was by this route that the mohawks had already come more than once on their errands of massacre and it was by this portal that the english were likely to come if they should ever attempt to overwhelm new france by an overland assault the region of the richelieu was therefore made as strong against incursion as this colonizing measure could make it all who took lands in this region whether seigneurs or habitants were to assemble in arms at the royal call their uniforms and muskets they kept for service and never during subsequent years was such a call without response these military settlers and their sons after them were only too ready to rally around the royal oriflamme at any opportunity it was from the armed seigneuries of the richelieu that hertel de rouville st Eur, and others quietly slipped forth and leaped with all the advantage of surprise upon the lonely hamlets of outlying massachusetts or new york how the english feared these gentils chambres let their own records tell for there these french colonials put many a streak of blood and fire but not all of the seigneuries were settled in this way and it was well for the best interests of the colony that they were not too often the good soldier made only an indifferent yeoman first in war he was last in peace the task of hammering spears into ploughshares and swords into pruning hooks was not altogether to his liking most of the officers gradually grew tired of their role as gentlemen of the wilderness and eventually sold or mortgaged their seigneuries and made their way back to france many of the soldiers succumbed to the lure of the western fur traffic and became coureurs de bois but many others stuck valiantly to the soil and to-day their descendants by the thousand possess this fertile land what were the obligations of the settler who took a grant of land within a seigneury on the whole they were neither numerous nor burdensome and in no sense were they comparable with those laid upon the hapless peasantry in france during the days before the great revolution every habitant had a written title deed from his seigneur and the terms of this deed were explicit the seigneur could exact nothing that was not stipulated therein these title deeds were made by the notaries of whom there seem to have been plenty in new france the census of sixteen hundred and eighty one listed no fewer than twenty-four of them in a population which had not yet reached ten thousand when the deed had been signed the notary gave one copy to each of the parties the original he kept himself these scribes were men of limited education and did not always do their work with proper care but on the whole they rendered useful service the deed first set forth the situation and area of the habitant's farm the ordinary extent was from one hundred to four hundred arpents usually in the shape of a parallelogram with a narrow frontage on the river and extending inland to a much greater distance every one wanted to be near the main road which ran along the shore it was only after all this land had been taken up that the incoming settlers were willing to have farms in the second range on the uplands away from the stream at any rate the habitant took his land subject to yearly payments known as the cent et rang the amount was small a few sous together with a stated donation in grain or poultry to be delivered each autumn reckoned in terms of present-day rentals the cent et rang 
amounted to half a dozen chickens or a bushel of grain for each fifty or sixty acres of land yet this was the only payment which the habitants of new france regularly made in return for their lands each autumn at michaelmas they gathered at the seigneur's house their carryalls filling his yard one by one they handed over their quota of grain or poultry and counted out their song in copper coins the occasion became a neighbourhood festival to which the women came with the men there was a general retailing of local gossip and a squaring up of accounts among the neighbours themselves but while this was the only regular payment made by the habitant it was not the only obligation imposed upon him in new france the seigneur had the exclusive right of grinding all grain and the habitants were bound by their title deeds to bring their grist to his mill and to pay the legal toll for milling this banalite as it was called did not bear heavily upon the people most of the complaints concerning it came rather from the seigneurs who claimed that the legal toll which amounted to one fourteenth of the grain did not suffice to pay expenses some of the seigneurs did not build mills at all but the authorities eventually moved them to action by ordering that those who did not provide mills at once would not be allowed to enforce the obligation of toll at any future date most of the seigneurial mills were crude wind-driven affairs which made poor flour and often kept the habitants waiting for days to get it usually built in tower-like fashion they were loopholed in order to afford places of refuge and defence against indian attack another seigneurial obligation was that of giving to the seigneur certain days of corvee or forced labour in each year in france this was a grievous burden peasants were taken from their own lands at inconvenient seasons and forced to work for weeks on the seigneur's domain but there was nothing of this sort in canada the amount of corvee was limited to six days at the most in any year of which only two days could be asked for at seed time and two days at harvest the seigneur for his part did not usually exact even this amount because the neighbourhood custom required that he should furnish both food and tools to those whom he called upon to work for him besides there were various details of a minor sort incidental to the seigneurial system if the habitant caught fish in the river one fish in every eleven belonged to the seigneur but seldom was any attention paid to this stipulation the seigneur was entitled to take firewood and building materials from the lands of his habitants if he desired but he rarely availed himself of this right on the morning of every may-day the habitants were under strict injunction to plant a maypole before the seigneur's house and this they never failed to do because the seigneur in return was expected to dispense hospitality to all who came bright and early in the morning the whole community appeared and greeted the seigneur with a salvo of blank musketry with them they carried a tall fir tree pulled bare to within a few feet of the top where a tuft of green remained having planted this maypole in the ground they joined in dancing and a feu de joie in the seigneur's honour and then adjourned for cakes and wine at his table there is no doubt that such good things disappeared with celerity before appetites whetted by an hour's exercise in the clear spring air after drinking to the seigneur's health and to the health of all his kin the merry company returned to their homes leaving behind them the pole as a souvenir of their homage that the seigneur was more than a mere landlord such an occasion testified the seigneurs of new france had the right to hold courts for the settlement of disputes among their tenantry but they rarely availed themselves of this privilege because owing to the sparseness of the population in most of the seigneuries the fines and fees did not produce enough income to make such a procedure worth while in a few populous districts there were seigneurial courts with regular judges who held sessions once or twice each week in some others the seigneur himself sat in judgment behind the living-room table in his own home and meted out justice after his own fashion the custom of paris was the common law of the land and all were supposed to know its provisions though few save the royal judges had any such knowledge when the seigneur himself heard the suitors his decision was not always in keeping with the law but it usually satisfied the disputants so that appeals to the royal courts were not common 
these latter tribunals each with a judge of its own sat at quebec three rivers and montreal their procedure like that of the seigneurial courts was simple free from chicane and inexpensive a lawsuit in new france did not bring ruinous costs i will not say remarks the facetious la Hontan, that the goddess of justice is more chaste here than in france but at any rate if she is sold she is sold more cheaply in canada we do not pass through the clutches of advocates the talons of attorneys and the claws of clerks these vermin do not as yet infest the land every one here pleads his own cause our themis is prompt and she does not bristle with fees costs and charges throughout the french period there was no complaint from the habitants concerning the burdens of the seigneurial tenure here and there disputes arose as to the exact scope and nature of various obligations but these the intendant adjusted with a firm hand and an eye to the general interest on the whole the system rendered a highly useful service by bringing the entire rural population into close and neighbourly contact by affording a firm foundation for the colony's social structure and by contributing greatly to the defence of unity of new france so long as the land was weak and depended for its very existence upon the solidarity of its people so long as the intendant was there to guide the system with a praetorian hand and to prevent abuses so long as strength was more to be desired than opulence the seigneurial system served new france better than any other scheme of landholding would have done it was only when the administration of the country came into new and alien hands that canadian seigneurialism became a barrier to economic progress and an obsolete system which had to be abolished End of chapter eight